In the Louisi, Jan Paul, Ben Webskewi, Nia Naga, New Jiao, New Jiao, Ben Webske. What I just told you is hello, my name is Jan Paul. I am Penobscot, and I'm from where the river I belong to, where the river widens. That song was created out of the water rights fighting in Standing Rock. And uh, we created our own, so feel free. If you have a water body that you love, please feel, do it yourself in your language or whatever it is. Um, is that, oh, and it's downloaded. You can download it off our website mm -hmm. and on our Penobscot Nation website. So, oh. so I've been, uh, work, I've lived on the island my whole life and I've worked for the tribe for 25 years. And I have lots of stories, but there's one I want to share with you today. And it was part of the video that you saw yesterday. Um, one day I was in Lincoln sampling, and I'm like three quarters way through in the most shallow part of the river. And I'm boating, and I'm sitting there, and I just cut to one site, and I was getting ready to get my clipboard, which the papers were you know, the wrong way. <laughs> One big gust of wind came, blew my papers all down river, the shallow part of the river. And I'm like, oh man. <laughs> it's like, I, got, I can't recreate it. And I'm like, so I hurry up, put the motor down, pull up the anchor, turn on, and I went flying down the river. <laughs> Didn't care if I was hitting, I go, I gotta get those data sheets because they're floating down. <laughs> but I got them all. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, Later on, in a few years after that, we were gifted by Angie. <laughs> so she's going to take over. <laughs> yes, so um, maybe Jen can finish one last line of what was the result of that? What did you ask me to do? <laughs> oh, to go. To go paperless. Yeah. <laughs> so no small task. Um, so I came on. Um, so I'm going to do my own introduction in a minute here, um, or right now, actually. So Kwe, Indaliwizi, Angie, um, Nuje Ao, Linnaeus, Maine. And so I'm using the language um, in honor of uh, actually Jan's nephew, especially, because he's a young language keeper on uh, Indian Island. Um, and I was talking to him about, like, should I use the language when I introduce myself in presentations because I'm not native? And he's like, yeah, it's a form of reconciliation. So this is my, actually my first time I've ever done it. And so it's a little bit nerve wracking, Jen. <laughs> so, so hopefully I did all right. Um, so I've been working uh, for Penobscot Nation as our water resources planner since 2004. So it's a long time. And we're actually sort of a, um, an anomaly in tribal water programs because there's often not many people that have been there very long. So for a long time, I was a, the person who was there the least. So I am helping to leave them a legacy of good data and management. Um, and so I'm also here, uh, shamelessly, I'm going to follow Ted's example of asking for help. So um, I'm shamelessly asking if when you see this little symbol, you are more than welcome to uh, help us with R or Python programming to accomplish the tasks that we're still working on. Um, so we have, I've been using R for probably a decade at this time, but I can always use more help. So, uh, and I also work with some other folks that could, could as well. 
so um, to give a little bit of background, um, Indian law in Maine is very complicated, we'll just say that. Uh, but one of the things that has come out of what is called the 1980 uh, Maine Land Claim, Indian Claim, Land Claim Settlement Act, I always get that wrong. Um, so one of the things that came out of that uh, was that sustenance fishing rights were reserved. Um, politically, it's been a very challenging atmosphere, but that has never been questioned. Um, unfortunately, um, many aspects of uh, current environment and politics um, impact the ability to do that. Um, and sustenance fishing is not just a, we like to eat fish and we want fish there, it is a part of an identity. Uh, Penobscot people get their actual name as Penobscot people uh, from the river. Um, so it is literally uh, everything about who they are. Um, this is also reflected in the notion that uh, Penobscot people see the Penobscot River as a relative, not a natural resource. So it's family. Um, she is family, in fact. I don't really like the English language to describe Penobscot River. So she is a river uh, to whom they have a responsibility. Um, and we actually play the water song in the beginning to give the sense of a different perspective of water. Um, I would ask yourself to, to, or I'd ask you to think, think about whether you have ever heard a song that talks about loving and respecting and thanking water. Uh, so we try to um, bring this and, and actually um, hopefully give everybody sort of a common sense of, of where we're coming from. Um, and so uh, there's actually a really an amazing uh, book called Braiding Sweetgrass written by a native author, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, I think this quote really reflects, again, this responsibility in it. She says, Sky Woman seems to look at me in the eye and ask, in return for this gift of a world on turtle's back, what will I leave in return? And for context, Native people consider the continent of what we now call North America um, as Turtle Island. Another quote that I feel like uh, really sets the stage for what we're going to talk about today is that our relationship with land cannot heal until we hear its stories. But the question becomes, who will tell them? And so Jan and I and our other staff on the Water Resources Program have been in blending, try to blend indigenous ways of knowing with Western science. And uh, we actually have a braid of sweetgrass here if folks are interested in coming up and um, engaging with it at the end. We are welcome to let you do that. Um, but I love the analogy to uh, this river channel right now that you see in this picture is, very, is a braided channel according to what most people call rivers. Um, so I like the analogy of braiding together both, uh, both ways of knowing but also cross-cultural dialogue because I am not native and Jan is and we've been spending 20 years thinking, yeah, we can get through this and it's, it's really hard work and we um, continue to, uh, to go through our many, many fun and amazing experiences and challenges and love each other through it. So another thing that I think bridges the gap between native uh, indigenous ways of knowing and Western science um, is that Renee's Brown, Brene Brown's amazing quote um, of maybe stories are just data with a soul. Uh, so I really, it helps me frame my work as a non-native person working for Penobscot Nation. Um, so what we're gonna do today is try to tell you the story of what we're doing. So reflecting Jan's uh, losing her data sheets, um, what I ended up taking on, one of the first tasks I took on was to make everything digital so we weren't losing paper anymore. Um, and I was reflecting on stories that I might tell during this presentation. And I spent so much time using a mouse that I actually had to go to physical therapy for a tennis elbow. Um, and so I actually ended up getting a different uh, keyboard with a cursor, like a touchpad in the middle so that I could, I could not have to experience that again. So it was a long, very long and arduous task. Uh, but we are now having all of our field data. We are printing uh, labels for our bottles that have QR codes. We're scanning them in the field. We come back, literally everything is connected. We check in our data, we print out chain of custodies, process our data in the lab, um, pre-process samples, and then process all the data in the lab. And we're still using this system that we developed probably 15 years ago. Um, so as I said earlier, my goal is to leave a legacy of good data. Um, so to do that, we have a team of folks. Uh, it's not just Jen and I. Uh, there's three other folks. Um, so we're out um, May to October around 134 sites, not every day, um, but usually um, at least once a week um, for most of them, taking direct measurements and collecting water quality samples. Um, we also do a fair amount of work investigating toxic levels in uh, various um, wildlife tissue plants as well as sediment. Uh, so this is what uh, we can offer the Penobscot Nation about their safety in relation to the water that actually gives them life. Uh, so. 
our work to protect the Penobscot River, which is the relative and identity of Penobscot people, is done in the context of recovering from cultural genocide. It can be easy for non-native scientists to come in and think, yeah, I'm just going to do some science. And that's just not the whole story. So one of the foundations of recovery is staying together with the land, river, and each other. So as I always hear Jan say many times, which in some ways is sad and in some ways beautiful, we're still here and we're not going anywhere. The fact that she has to say we're still here because in the beginning, they were, it was an attempt to eliminate them. So they're still here and they're not going anywhere. And singing, drumming, and dancing together is a foundational way that Penobscot people make this happen. Another way is removing dams. Uh, Penobscot Nation was integral in getting two dams uh, taken out of the Penobscot River in the lower part. Uh, and this is one of the areas our programs and our data collection can make a difference. And so this is, a, this is a, a little bit of background behind the slide. So this is actually the, some counts of fish coming back um, up, the dam, up the river now that the two, the two lower dams are out. So they improved some fish passage in the first, first dam that the fish now experience. And when I was making this graph and thinking about including it in this presentation, I thought I had this, and it was a little bit difficult, um, had this image in my mind of, I didn't ever think that I could actually make a graph of genocide. And I thought, all of the fish that were not able to come back up the river for more than 100 years, that is absolutely a graph of what has happened to Penobscot people. Um, but the beauty of it is that staying together and praying and working to do water quality monitoring work and, and taking dams out is bringing fish back. So the second uh, graph down the river herring is the most impressive story. Uh, in the past year since the dam has been taken out, this past year is even the more impressive one. On average, it's about two and a half million river herring have come up to Penobscot River uh, as compared to literally none prior to those dams being taken out. This year, it was over five million. So it's exciting to say that we are recovering from it. Uh, another aspect that it actually taken dams out, this is a um, the smaller image is when the dam was still in and after what it looks like afterwards. Um, and we, we actually collected da uh, data before and after dam removal, and we found that it actually does restore. These are run-of-the-river dams, which are small, so they're not a lot of storage, um, but they do res it does restore the natural temperature variation regime. So as I said, we're also collecting fish, fish uh, samples. So from the sea run, fish returning to the Penobscot, collect them at the fish lift, and then we process them in our lab and send them away for analysis. We're also collecting some data on fish, uh, excuse me, fish tissue analysis on fish in lakes, in our trust land lakes. Um, and so we're analyzing that data. All of these, all of these analyses have been done in R at this point in time. Um, and uh, here's your first chance to think about how you might be able to help with some statistics. We're also trying to predict um, what, what um, con concentrations of mercury will be in fish tissue in these lakes based on the watershed characteristics of the surrounding lake, sort of surrounding the lake. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting experience, but um, we, we absolutely could use some help with that. So ultimately, this leads to fish consumption advisories. Uh, we've made some in the past, uh, and so we've actually developed what's called the Wild Food Safety Series, and it's a bit of a balance between wanting Penobscot people to be safe, but not wanting to tell them to not be who they are or practice their culture. Uh, so we chose Wild Food Safety Series to say, yep, you might be eating fish, but we want you to do it safely. The unfortunate message is sea run fish coming back up the river. The hope was that Penobscot people would get to more of a traditional diet. Unfortunately, those fish are sometimes even more contaminated than the non sea run fish. Another thing we do is we upgrade river classification. So in Maine, there's a classification for every water body in the state. Um, so we, in 2017, one of, one of the, we've done this in the past and upgraded many hundreds of miles. But the, the more recent one was in 2017, we submitted a proposal to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Their last reach was at class C, and we wanted to upgrade it to class B. And so POSIT and, and open source tools helped us to easily summarize this data and provide all of this information as part of our proposal. They, sub, they accepted the proposal and uh, because we had sufficient data to, to prove it. So it was exponentially easier than in the past to prove this. Um, in May of 2018, they sent it out for public comment because that's what has to happen. Um, and actually, in April of May in 2019, we used our data um, to work with some Casco Bay High School juniors, uh, which is down about two and a half hours south of us, um, to talk to them about the work that we do. And actually, 52 students wrote letters of support. We are happy to say that in June of 2019, the bill passed um, and the governor signed it into law. 
Another thing we do is we do a lot of outreach with students. Um, this is actually some of the Indian Island School students. Uh, the big picture is, of course, of one of Jan's relatives uh, collecting the sample. So bacteria monitoring is much easier these days. So we go out and collect samples. Uh, and then you can see Jan helping them process them in the top right, and then counting them, and me uh, talking about how do we graph this data. Another aspect of that is doing outreach on it. This is a Tableau visualization I did a long time ago. Notice I would love to recreate this in Shiny. I do not have the skills to do that. Um, so what I'd like to um, be able to show where our violations are on this. You know, the, you can click on a dot on the map, and it filters out the data, vice versa. So I'd love to be able to recreate this in Shiny. And then the broader aspect of what we do uh, is I actually, as a member of, of representative of Penobscot Nation, I sit on what a group is called Tribal Exchange Network Group. So we support tribes across Turtle Island, or what we usually call the United States, in the management, analysis, and sharing of environmental data. Another chance to, uh, to volunteer if you want. So I'm here shamelessly asking for help again. So we actually serve, there are 576 federally recognized tribal nations. Um, so we are try, trying to get out and get training on any aspect of data, data management, data analysis. Um, there's a wide spectrum of skills, wide spectrum of things that are being done. Um, so we're a small group. Uh, we're all sort of, we call ourselves volunteer, but so we get paid by our respective tribal nation, uh, but the work that we do is, is not um, compensated for usually. Uh, so we do a wide variety of things. We've been holding tribal data and technology academy workshops, which are carpentry workshops historically. Uh, we're doing data drop-in sessions, so they're month monthly uh, group sessions. I have personally done on my own what other people are doing, tribal assistance, but I've pr probably done about 200 hours of helping people code in R. Uh, another interesting aspect would be to also do Python because uh, most tribes use uh, Esri mapping software, which has Python under the hood. Uh, and we're actually talking about developing our first tribal R slash Python user group uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So this is a, another song by uh, Jan's nephew actually gave. So we are um, wanting to create a braid of stories that are meant to heal the world, relationship with the world. This is another quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. So we've started this, and then we started working with TXG, Tribal Exchange Network Group. Um, and then through that, we've met some amazing people. Kunal Marwaha was one of the first carpentry teachers. And then Jess, and Jan, Jess Kunke and Jan Ning were also carpentry instructors. And all three of them have helped immensely uh, ever since. Um, and then Jacqueline Janice from Posit was an amazing resource to us to get connected and be able to come to this conference and do everything that we've been doing. Um, so much appreciation for every single one of these people. So we are, would love help in creating, creating the braid, the stories to heal our relationship with the world. Uh, we already have a lot of people doing it, um, but we'd love if you want to participate and join us, we would love to have you join us. And you can email us. Uh, there's, we also have uh, ways to sign up. You can take one of these brochures. We left them over there. You can sign up or you can scan the, UR, UR, uh, the QR, QR code and sign up electronically as well. So thanks for having us. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, so I have a personal question. I come from Denmark, we're surrounded by water. We have not been treating that water well. So, and I think we're not unique. And one of the issues is that people don't see what's underneath the water. Mm. They don't see what's in their face in the same way that land issues, environmental land issues uh, is visible. Mm. Do you have any, um, do you know anything about how to inspire the right people when it's not in their face? How do you tell the story to inspire the change that is needed? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. You gotta get them in the water or get them in the water. Yeah. You can't force them to be in there, but yeah. I think you can't deny something right in your face. So encourage them to go to the river, show them what's wrong with it. Yeah, yeah I would say that that's exactly what Jan and I have been doing with a lot of student groups and people in general is right, telling the story and building relationships. Um, and it's a lot harder to do something to someone you care about, again, if the river is a relative, 
Um, we actually encourage people to download the water song and have a relationship by playing, playing the water song for your local water body because that changes your perspective a lot. Make an offering. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much again. You're welcome. Thank you.